Hello, my friends. This is part four in a series of videos on the difference between an EBP, evidence-based practice, and science. And in this video, we're going to focus on theoretical frameworks. We're going to do two things. I think we can get both of these done in one video. We'll see what is a theoretical framework. And secondly, what is the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology? So first, what is a theoretical framework? So to read from our slide here, there are many components to conducting research and evaluating the results of the research. Good research is not just a matter of obtaining a positive result from a controlled research study. There is a wide spectrum of research methods and many factors that are important for conducting research with the goal that this research gives evidence for how astrology works or how it does not work. One very important component of research in any evidence-based practical is the theoretical framework. And in bold, all research is conducted within the context of a theoretical framework. There is always a theoretical framework, even if the researcher does not articulate what it is. Research in VA is conducted within the, the theoretical framework that we use for vibrational astrology. So everything is done within this framework. Just from the word, you already have an idea of what this means. There's a theoretical framework, like a, a structure within which the specific research is conducted. So on the next slides, we will describe what the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology is. But first, let's review some terminology in astronomy. Because the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology is built upon facts in astronomy. It's built upon ideas in physics. Let me say that again. Vibrational astrology is built on a, a theoretical framework. It's built on a an understanding of the world, an overall philosophical idea of how things work. That's what the theoretical framework is. The assumptions, the assumptions, the perspective upon which your specific ideas are grounded. Everything is, every kind of research is assuming certain things about the nature of life. And there are clear assumptions in vibrational astrology. Those assumptions for the details of vibrational astrology are embedded in facts of astronomy. Where the planets actually are, what they're actually doing, is important for understanding the framework, the, the philosophical perspective of vibrational astrology. And there are also things in science, particularly in physics, that are a foundation for vibrational astrology. There are also ideas in modern psychological astrology, in Buddhism and Taoism. A lot of psychological, philosophical, and scientific concepts are a basis for how we view astrology, using vibrational astrology. So we have to know a little bit about astronomy and physics in order to understand the context in which vibrational astrology was born. That context is the theoretical framework. So we need to make a little digression here and we need to learn some astronomy, some basic things. So let's do that now. Number one, terminology. In astrology, we often call the sun and moon planets. So, we'll, you know, we'll say you have a lot of planets in Gemini. What planets do I have in Gemini? Oh, my sun, Mercury, and Mars. So we use the word planets and we include sun and moon very often when we say the word planets. We get so accustomed to this that we may not even realize that we are calling the sun and moon planets, even though technically they're not actually planets. Just to clarify that. Okay. So when we use the word planets in vibrational astrology and most, and most forms of astrology, that includes the sun and moon. Number two, the sun rises in the east. <laughs> no matter where you live, if you live in Japan, you live in Canada, wherever you live, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. Right? Okay, good. Number three, 
It's not just the sun that rises in the east. All planets rise in the east. Mercury rises in the east. Venus rises in the east. Neptune rises in the east. All planets rise in the east and set in the west. And all of them take about 24 hours. Not exactly 24 hours. About 24 hours from the time they rise to about 24 hours later, they will rise again. It's just that when the sun rises, it wakes you up in the morning and you have to go to work or whatever. Um, and when the planets rise, it's not necessarily in the morning. It could be any time of day. And you don't really notice it because it doesn't light up the whole sky. So, just going over some very basic astronomy. These are facts. Point number four. If you look at the planets in the sky, you look at where Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter are in the sky, what does it look like? Are they, are they connected somehow? Yes. They are in a band or a belt. They are not quite in a perfect line. Actually, it wouldn't be a line. It would be a circle because they're not in a circle that goes all the way around you. We call the circle that goes all the way around you a great circle. So in astronomy, we have a word for great circle. The most obvious great circle is the horizon if you were out in the middle of the ocean with no land. So if you were on a boat, suppose you're on a small boat on the ocean far enough away from land that you cannot see any land and it's fairly calm you don't have a lot of big turbulent waves fairly calm you would see a circle around you where the ocean meets the sky right that is the celestial horizon that's an example of a great circle there are other great circles so now you know the term great circle very important word and our Theoretical framework for vibrational astrology, uh, for some details of it, involve understanding what great circles are. So on the next slide, let's look at the band of planets. Planets are like in a belt. Not in a perfect great circle, but in a belt. Um, so here is a chart done for August 12, 2016 at 8.10 p.m. in Los Angeles, California. And notice the sun is in the sixth house, means it's below the horizon. So the sun had just set. It is far enough away from the ascendant, 10 degrees, that it's dark. It gets dark once the sun is fairly, you know, this far below the horizon. Typically, it'll get dark. And so it's gotten dark, and Venus is a little above the horizon, probably enough above the horizon that we could see it. And then Mercury, because uh, this right side is the west um, in a chart, and so this would be on the western horizon. Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn are higher in the sky, the moon. And Pluto is up there, but of course you cannot see Pluto. It's too small to see with the naked eye. So this chart is from a little after sunset and dark enough for the stars to be visible. Moon, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus are visible. A lot of visible planets, which is why we're using this particular date. And also, I found an image of the sky for this particular time, which I will show you on the next sli slide. And as I mentioned, Pluto is also above the horizon, but it's not visible without an extremely powerful telescope. Let's see these planets in the night sky. So we astrologers are used to looking at a chart wheel. But what does it actually look like in the sky... Uh, oh, one more thing before I show it to you. Why is east on the left? Before we continue, why is east on the left? If I do a map of geographic regions, like if we look at a map of the United States, Europe, etc., east is on the right, correct? Just think about a map of Europe or Africa or, or anywhere. East is on the right. Why is east on the left in an astrology chart? Have you ever thought about that? East is on the left because the chart wheel is a picture of the sky when you face south. So if you get off your chair or if you're standing up, whatever, face south. When you face south, where is east? East is on your left and west is on your right. The chart wheel is a 
picture of the sky when you face south. You don't often hear that or learn that in astrology, but that's what's happening. Also, sometimes people say that the planets above you are south or something. That's wrong. The planets above you are above you. The planets below you are <laughs> below you. <laughs> so you might say, where is north and south? They are not in the chart wheel. Because the chart wheel is an image of the entire sphere. And a sphere doesn't have four directions. So if you try to reduce the, the celestial sphere, the whole sky around you, to four directions, good luck, you're going to go crazy. There aren't four directions. So we've broken it down in our chart wheel to above you, to the left of you if you face south, to the right of you if you're facing south, so that would be east and west, above you and below you. That's what the chart wheel is showing. So if you've been told that above the Saturn and Mars and the moon are south, that's wrong. Not necessarily true. It may be true. It may be false. Forget it. There's a lot of things you're told that are wrong. Um, the top of the chart is above you, the bottom of the chart is below you. That will always be true. Now, um, here is the actual sky. So that's what the sky looked like. It looks like I forgot to give the source of this. I tried to give the source. I, I neglected to do that. Sorry, I'll try to dig that up just for... Professional purposes, we should always give the source. But anyway, this yellow curve, that's a great circle. That's a circle that goes all the way around us, with us in the middle. That's the path of the sun, also known as the ecliptic plane. A perfect circle, a great circle. Notice that Jupiter and Venus... Moon, Saturn, and Pluto are on one side of the ecliptic plane. Mercury and Mars are on the other side. So Pluto, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus are above the ecliptic plane. Mercury and Mars are below the ecliptic plane. Also notice that the moon is very far, relative to the other planets, very far away from the ecliptic plane. Obviously, what they did here is they put in uh, images for the moon. The moon isn't going to look like that. Mars isn't going to look exactly like that. They put in, um, you know, their own little graphic images to make it clear, which I think is nice for our purposes. We can read this very clearly, that Venus, Jup Venus and Jupiter are slightly above the ecliptic plane, Jupiter only very slightly, Saturn very slightly, Pluto very slightly, uh, Venus looks like a little more, Moon very much more, Mars below, and Mercury a little bit below. That's the band. They are not in a perfect circle. How do we take this band of planets and make a chart wheel, which is a perfect circle? This perfect circle in your chart wheel is the ecliptic plane. That's what it is. It's the ecliptic plane. And the planets are all close to the ecliptic plane. So let's read from our slide here. The yellow curve, actually a circle, which astronomers call a great circle. Any circle with us in the middle, or the Earth in the middle, I should say, is a great circle. And this uh, yellow great circle is the path of the sun, We call, also known as the ecliptic plane. Notice that the planets are in a band, or you can call it a band or a belt, whatever you want to call it, rather than being in a perfect circle. Question one. What is the distance of the planet from the ecliptic plane called? So we have a term that tells us that the moon is far away from the ecliptic plane, and Saturn and Jupiter are closer. This distance, which is measured in degrees from 0 to 360 degrees that we have in a circle, what is that distance called? Anybody know? Give you a few seconds to think about it. The distance from the ecliptic plane. The position along the ecliptic plane is the zodiac longitude. And we divide this ecliptic plane into 12 equal sections of 30 degrees and we give them names. So along this ecliptic plane, we have the 12 signs of the zodiac. Those 
12, 30 degree sections. But what is this distance from the ecliptic plane? Okay, you can pause this if you want to think about it. I'm going to go to the next video and give you the, to the next slide, I mean, and show, give you the answer. Um, it is the ecliptic latitude. It's, the, it's called the latitude of the planets. And when you look at this diagram, I've got the diagram of the sky, you know, the image of the sky. I've got the chart wheel on the left. And in this chart wheel, I've listed the latitude of the planets, and it tells us the moon is 5 north 14. That means a little more than 5 degrees. So that's a little more than 5 degrees above the ecliptic plane. What I've done down here is I've zoomed in a little bit so you can see this more clearly. Saturn is much closer. Saturn is 1 north. Jupiter is also 1 north. Round it off. Saturn, 1 north, 37. Jupiter, 1 north, 07. Pluto, 1 north, 18. There's Pluto, slightly above the ecliptic plane. Um, so we have Venus, 1 north, 26. Jupiter, 1 north, 07. Saturn, 1 north, 37. Pluto, 1 north, 18. All very close. You can see that Venus is a little farther from the ecliptic plane than Jupiter. And Venus is 1 north 26, Jupiter is only 1 north 07. So as you know, there are 16 minutes in a degree. So 1 north 37 is a little more than 1 and a half degrees. That's the latitude. Saturn is 1 north, uh, sorry, Saturn is 1, uh, not Saturn, what am I looking for? Um, Mercury is 1 south 17, there's Mercury. And Mars is 2 south 51. Mars is farther from the ecliptic plane than Mercury. So that is the latitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, do these ecliptic latitudes shown in the software, in the series software, do they agree with what you see in the image of the sky? Yes, they do. They agree. So, all of this becomes important for understanding the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. The zodiac longitude is the zodiac position that we are familiar with. For example, the moon position is 17 Sagittarius 04, 7 degrees 4 minutes of Sagittarius. There's the moon. Um, Saturn, 9 Sagittarius, a little bit before it. Mars, a little bit before that, 4 Sagittarius. So there it is. There's Pluto, a little farther away from these three, and there it is, a little farther away at 15 Capricorn 23. So... The chart wheel isn't showing us, it shows us the longitude of the planets. And it shows them from a starting point. The zero Aries in the tropical zodiac. Uh, and the starting point is the vernal equinox. It's where the sun is when spring begins. And that's how we define zero Aries. So we have a starting point on this circle, which is where the sun is when Spring begins, and the first 30 degrees is called Aries, next 30 degrees is called Taurus, and so on. Now, question. Another question for you. All of this astronomy is going to be important for understanding the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. How is zodiac latitude shown in the chart wheel? Well, we see it in this table. The latitude, you know, I put a table in here where we can see it, but can we see it in the chart wheel? So we see the zodiac latitude in the image of the sky. I see that moon is has a, a large north latitude. Five degrees is relatively large. I see it there. But do I see it in the chart wheel? Do I see it? Yes or no? And if yes, how do you see it? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Answers on the next slide. It's interesting that the very, very basics of what we're doing in astrology are sometimes unclear. And understanding what we're doing in astrology helps us understand how astrology works, as we will see. Answer, we do not see zodiac latitude in the chart wheel. In fact, zodiac latitude is removed. We remove latitude. We make believe the planets are on the ecliptic plane. So in astrology, we do not interpret where the moon is. 
we use the moon's position projected onto the ecliptic plane. We take the nearest point on the ecliptic plane, we drop at 90 degrees, go to the nearest point on the ecliptic plane, and we use the position of the moon projected on the ecliptic plane. Isn't that weird? We, in astrology, do not interpret where the moon is, or Mars, or Saturn. We interpret their projected positions on the ecliptic plane. Now, it's not a huge difference, but it is different. And in vibrational astrology, we use all kinds of fractions of the circle, and slight differences make a big difference in the interpretation, and this latitude makes a difference. It makes a difference whether you use the actual moon or the projected position. What I'm doing is I'm telling you the facts. I'm not yet giving you an opinion about it. I'm just saying these are the facts. This is what we do. These are called the projected positions. We do not use the actual positions of the planets. Except the sun. The sun, by definition, is on the ecliptic plane. We do interpret the actual position of the sun. We do not interpret the actual position of the other planets. We interpret their projected positions. And what you're seeing in your chart wheel are the projected positions where every planet is projected, in other words, dropped 90 degrees to the nearest point on the ecliptic plane. That's what we do. This is going to help us understand later when I describe how astrology works, because this is going to imply something about what's actually going on. Now, just so you know, and this becomes important as well, so it's not really not just so you know, because this becomes part, uh, becomes important information for building a theoretical framework, is there are five great circles that are often used. There is the ecliptic plane, which we see here, the path of the sun, the sun will go through almost the same exact stars every year. So that's very stable over many hundreds of years. The ecliptic plane. There's the celestial horizon. We talked about that before. What you see if you're out on the ocean and far enough away from land that you do not see the land. And that, the celestial horizon, is the easiest one to visualize or imagine. Just imagine there are no valleys and mountains and buildings and whatever else. That perfect geometric horizon. Notice that the celestial horizon is not a physical horizon. It's like a mathematical horizon. The only time you would physically actually see it is when you're out on the ocean. On a, on a calm day, you would see it. Uh, and you can see part of it if you go to the beach. And, you know, you can see part of that. And you can't see the whole horizon celestial horizon unless you're out on the ocean, obviously. There's another one, a third one called the celestial equator, which is a peculiar thing. You take the equator of the Earth, you're all familiar with the Earth, it has North Pole, South Pole, and an equator, and you extend the equator, an imaginary equator, out forever, out into the sky. And where the equator of the Earth extended all the way out into the sky, where that appears against the sky is called the celestial equator. How weird is that? Like, why would you want to extend the equator all the way out into the sky and know where it is? Well, it ends up giving some very useful information. And over 2,000 years ago, astrologers, who were also astronomers, were aware of the celestial horizon, they were aware of the ecliptic plane, and they were aware of the celestial equator. And they actually knew where they were and would measure where they are. Fascinating. So these ideas are very old. Now there are two other great circles that are less often used. Uh, let's go down to the meridian plane, number five, the meridian plane is used extensively in Western astrology, whether it's medieval or modern psychological, also vibrational astrology. We use the meridian plane. In Vedic astrology, they don't use it uh, hardly at all. The meridian plane is a plane that 
it goes north and south, it goes over your head north and south, it takes the horizon, and if you think of the horizon as cutting the sky in half, the meridian plane cuts it in quarters. So it's 90 degrees to the horizon, and it goes in a north-south direction. The meridian plane is interesting because when a planet reaches its highest point, like when the sun rises in the east and then reaches its highest point in the sky, it's on the meridian plane. So the meridian plane defines the highest point that planets and stars reach in their daily motion, what we call their diurnal motion. Every day the planets rise, culminate is a word we use, reach the top, and then they set. So the meridian plane, the fifth one here, is where planets reach their highest point and lowest point. And the prime vertical was introduced more in the 20th century. So the first three go back over 2,000 years. I don't know if prime vertical was ever discussed in ancient astrology or even early 20th century. Maybe on rare occasion, but probably not. And if it was, not very much. I think they were aware of it. Certainly they were aware of it, but it never got much attention. The prime vertical, I often describe as the third um, plane in a room. Think of the celestial horizon as the floor. The celestial horizon is the floor. If you're in a house right now or a building, there's a floor. That floor extended out is essentially, I mean, the floor may not be perfectly um, level for this purpose, but it, it's very, very close to the celestial horizon, right? And also the ceiling is, because when you take the ceiling and the floor and you stretch them out thousands and thousands and thousands and hundreds and thousands and millions of miles, they actually become so close together you cannot distinguish them. So the let's just call it the floor for now, is the floor of a building, is the celestial horizon. If the room is designed so that one wall is north-south and the other walls are east-west, those walls that go north-south, extended all the way out, are the meridian plane, and the other walls that go east-west are the prime vertical. So one of the people who came up with this idea of the prime vertical was an astrologer named Edward Jandro. And Jandro felt that the prime vertical is like the missing one. I don't think he explained it this way, but maybe he did. I don't know where I got this idea from, if I made it up or read it somewhere. Is that it's like the missing third plane to make a room. You have the floor, you have the east-west walls, and you have the north-south walls. And so the prime vertical, the horizon plane, and the meridian plane are like three components of the local space that you're in. Anyway, these are great circles. Why are great circles important? Number one, your chart wheel is a great circle. It's the ecliptic plane. And what we're going to find out is that these other great circles are very important as well. Okay, we need to know about this so that we can discuss the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. Okay, we are at 30 minutes, so it's going to go into the next video. The next video is on the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. So we now know enough astronomy to learn the theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. I'm going to refer to what we just learned about the astronomy to, to explain our theoretical framework for vibrational astrology. Thank you very much for listening, my friends. God bless. Namaste.